is the case of a girl named Shonda Sharer, and I actually saved this time the name of the subscriber who requested this video, and this one was requested by Emma B. Eleven. So thank you, Emma, for requesting this case. I do want to put a warning out there. I always do at the start of videos, but mainly everyone involved in this case, the victim, as well as the perpetrators, are all under the age of 18. So, you know, the events that take place in this case are very raw and, and gruesome and very sad, um, because it has to deal with a minor. I especially want to put that warning out there that can be very, very triggering. Um, and like I always say at the start of these videos, this video is not intended for anyone under the age of 14. Okay? So, just wanted to put that warning out there. Do with that what you will. So, I am not only going to give you background information on the the murderer in this case. I'm also going to give you background information on the victim as well because it's all relevant and it's one big story that I am going to tell you. Okay, so Shonda Sharer was born in Pineville, Kentucky on June 6th, 1979. Her parents are Stephen and Jacqueline Sharer. Around fifth grade, her parents actually got divorced, and her mom remarried, and they they moved from Pineville to Louisville. So she did fifth and sixth grade at this private Catholic school called St. Paul's School, where she was on the cheerleading squad, the volleyball team, she was on the softball team. She was very much involved and a people person, very athletic, as you can see, very active. And she was really, really doing well for herself. In 1991, she was now 12 years old, her mom actually divorced again, and they moved one more time to New Albany, Indiana, where she then began to attend Hazelwood Junior High. Okay, so we're going to put a pause on Shanda for a second, and now we are going to talk about the ringleader, the mastermind behind everything that we're going to get into. Her name is Melinda Loveless. I think it's very ironic that her last name is Loveless. Melinda Loveless was born in New Albany on October 28th, 1975. So she was a little bit older than Shonda, but four years older. Her parents were Larry and Marjorie Loveless, and Melinda was the youngest of three daughters. So, focusing on Larry for a second, Melinda had a very rough, to put it lightly, relationship with her father. Everyone in the family did. Um, he was a Vietnam veteran, and when he got home, you know, everyone treated him like a hero, and everybody loved him, according to his wife. But she later described him a pervert. He would sometimes wear his daughter's as well as his wife's underwear around the house. He would sometimes wear their makeup. He was incapable of staying monogamous, and he had this fascination with trying to set his wife up with other men and women and watching them together. So his wife 
needless to say, was miserable in her marriage. He also sexually abused her as well, and um, there were a few times where she actually tried to commit suicide, but was never successful. So, <laughs> she was just miserable, and on top of all of that, he would, you know, do these, like, side jobs now, and all the money that he got for that, he would keep to himself. He would not share it with his family. He would not spend it on his children. Not towards the bills, not towards the house, nothing. He would keep it for himself for selfish purposes. He was a very impulsive buyer, and he was just not a family man. He was not what a father should be. So, in 1990, Melinda's parents got divorced, and Larry moved to Florida. And at first, he kept, he kept in contact with his kids, um, sending them letters, things like that. Um, but as time went on, the letters were fewer and fewer, and eventually the contact just kind of stopped. Okay, so that's a background on both of two of the most important girls in the story. So now, as I said, Shonda was now going to Hazelwood Junior High. And when she first started going there, she met a girl named Amanda. And they did not get along at first. They actually got into a fight one day, and they both got detention. And it was in detention that their relationship started to change. They started to pass notes in detention as friends, and then those notes eventually became romantic letters, and they started to have feelings for each other, and had a romantic relationship. Now, Amanda, this girl, actually had a history They were involved for about a year together, which, yeah, these are middle schoolers and all of this is happening. It's crazy. Um, but they, they had a history, and so Melinda saw this new girl, Shonda, with her ex and immediately became very, very jealous. In October of that year, Shonda and Amanda went to school dances together, and Melinda saw them there, and she had had enough. She actually approached Shonda and just started to, you know, try to intimidate her and be mean to her and, and all this, and it actually carried forward after that, and she would talk about her in public. She would threaten her. She would talk about, oh, I'm going to kill this girl. And Shonda was only 12 years old at the time. So, once, you know, word got around that she was talking about killing this girl, Shonda's mom found out and pulled her out of school and transferred her to another private Catholic school. And this one was called Our Lady of Perpetual Help School. And she did this to protect her, obviously, which I think is very admirable. So now let's get into the main events of this case, and this is where it's going to start to get a little rough, and I'm going to continue to keep looking down on my notes, maybe a little 
somewhere in here um, in my notes, but Laurier, I'm almost positive, never met Shonda as well. And so they were just doing this to help Melinda out. So, one day, on this day, January 10th, the girls drove out to Shonda's father's house. She often stayed with him on the weekends so that she could see him. And they drove to the house and Melinda ordered the two younger girls to go to the door and ask for Shonda. Obviously, Melinda couldn't go because Shonda saw her coming. She probably wouldn't have even answered the door. But Melinda told them to go to the door and to tell Shonda that Amanda was waiting for her and they were going to bring Shonda to her. Amanda, again, in case you forgot, is the girl that she was having a romantic little relationship with. Um, and so Shonda believed the girls and of course wanted to go see Amanda, but she couldn't leave right then, so she told them to come back when her father was asleep. Um, and so that's what they set out to do. Um, and keep in mind now that Melinda had recruited these girls but the girls really didn't know what was going to happen. Um, they knew that Melinda was hiding in the car and they knew that she had a knife, but they were told that she just wanted to threaten Shonda with a knife, which isn't better, but they had no idea that Melinda was actually going to try to hurt this girl badly. Um, so they planned to come back later on when Shonda's dad was asleep and so they ended up going to some like punk rock concert in town for a band named Sunspring in the meantime. So around 12.30 in the morning, a little past midnight, they show up to the house and they bring Shonda in the car. Melinda is hiding in the back of the car under a blanket with the knife in her hand. And now the girls told Shonda that Amanda was waiting at this place called the Witch's Castle, which was like, kind of like a vacant lot sort of thing. A lot of teenagers had parties there sometimes, but it was like, it was usually empty. Um, it was like a local hangout. Anyway, um, so that's where they told her that Amanda was waiting for her, so that's where they set out to go. During the drive, however, Melinda then decided to jump out from under the blanket, and she held the knife to Shauna's throat, and she began interrogating her about her sexual relationship with Amanda. So, of course, Shonda started to freak out. She started to cry. She was understandably very nervous about what was about to happen. So, they take her to this witch's castle place. She's crying. They take her out of the car and they tie her hands together as well as her legs. And the four girls begin to taunt her intimidate her, they take her rings, they take her watch, and they just begin to bully her, but nothing severe as of yet. Shonda's just crying and crying. So then they take her back into the car, and they cover her with a blanket, and they attempt to go back to Lori's house. Lori was the other 17-year-old girl. Um, but of course, GPSs were not a thing at that time, and so they get lost twice, stopping at two different gas stations, asking for directions, all while Shonda is being held under a blanket in the car. Eventually, they get to a piece of land, like woods, a woodsy area, near Lori's house, and they dig Shonda out of the car again. And the two younger girls actually stay in the car because now they're starting to get a little nervous and it's becoming too much for them and they're not really understanding what's going on 
said they decided to take turns stabbing her in the chest. They then strangled her with a rope and threw her back in the trunk wrapped up in that blanket and at this point they thought that she was dead. So they decided to go back to Lori's house which again wasn't far away. They decided to, you know, clean themselves up, drink some sodas, and then they realized that Shonda was still alive. She was kicking and crying in the trunk, and they heard her. So Melinda and Lori go outside, open the trunk. Melinda stabs her a couple of more times with that knife, and then Lori and Melinda drive back to those same woods where Melinda could beat her more. This time with a tire iron. And the two young girls stay back at the house. At this point, they really don't want a lot to do with it. So now, again, they think that Shonda is dead and they put her back in the trunk. They go back to Lori's house and they laughingly tell the two younger girls what happened and what more they did to her. In the early hours of that morning, the girls, all four of them, go to a gas station to put gas in the car. They also buy a two-liter bottle of Pepsi that they immediately empty and fill with gasoline. They then take Shonda to another remote location that they could find and they drag her out of the car. Shonda's still alive, which again, they find out. And she's unable to speak. She's unable to really cry. All she can do is mumble, Mommy. They then cover her in gasoline and they light her on fire and just left her there. Melinda then ordered the girls to go back a few minutes later to pour more gasoline on her and to finally confirm that she was dead. And that is how Shonda died. At 9.30 a.m. that morning, the four girls go to McDonald's for breakfast, where they are laughing and making conversation about it. I read somewhere that they were comparing the sausages that they were eating to Melinda's, like, burning body. This is the this next part is the part that stuns me, but then I have to remember how young these girls are. So that same day, Melinda goes to Amanda, the girl that she was jealous of Shonda over, and tells her everything. Just tells her everything that happened, everything that they did, and that she told another friend as well. But of course, made them promise not to tell anybody. And Amanda actually didn't believe it at first, uh, but then Melinda showed her Lori's drunk, covered in blood, and then Amanda believed her. And Amanda promised not to tell anyone, and I believe that uh, she and Melinda actually started up a romantic relationship again after that. Um, however, that same day, the two younger girls involved, the 15-year-olds Hope and Tony, go to the sheriff's office with their parents and confess everything. Everything. They just felt horrible about it eventually and just had to come clean. And the very next day, all four girls were in custody because of the severity of the case and the torture all four girls were tried as adults and they accepted plea bargains to avoid the death penalty. Hope and Tony were younger and they were involved in last torture and they came clean so they got shorter sentences. Um, Hope got 20 years and Tony got 35. Lori and Melinda each got 60 years. And I actually have a statement 
from Lori, the other 17 year old and she said I didn't know Shonda at all I didn't go into that evening knowing anything was going to happen wanting anything to happen I didn't peer pressure, that's all it was it spiraled out of control way too fast it's something that should never have happened and I don't exactly know the details as of how, but Lori was released January of 2018. Um, exactly a year ago. I don't know if it was like good behavior, I don't know. But definitely wasn't 60 years. And then I have a statement from Shonda's mother from 2012 that read in part, quote, I had many times said, if you want to see as close to a person who has absolutely nothing inside of them, look into Melinda's eyes because there's nothing there. Now, here's where things changed, I guess, for the better for Melinda. Remember I told you about her childhood and so her whole life she has just been in this cycle of abuse and violence and I'm not saying it makes it okay at all, but remember that's all that she was around. So being in prison, surprisingly, was the first time that she was able to break that that cycle of violence, and she just wasn't around it anymore. So she began to change for the better, and the prison that she was in had this uh, program called the Indiana Canine Assistant Network, where basically prisoners could train puppies to be assistants for people with disabilities. And so she did a lot of really good work with them and kind of found her place there. And the breeder that she was working with, that worked with the program, actually got in contact with Shonda's mother many, many years later and convinced her to watch a video of Melinda and how she had changed and how she had grown. And Shonda's mother said, I was really taken aback. I saw someone almost re reborn. She was sincere. She was compassionate. I think the ICANN program allows her to have something in her life that she can show love back to, and there's never betrayal on either side. So then, Shauna's mother very generously donated a puppy to the program. The puppy's name was Angel, and it was donated specifically for Melinda to train. And Shonda's mother said that she did it in Shonda's honor. She said that she knew that that's what Shonda would have wanted. So then Melinda says, I have one more statement. And Melinda said about Shonda's mother, she helped me to heal, forgive, and grow, whether she wanted that or not. She did a good thing. I would thank her. I couldn't thank her enough. Angels in good hands, and I'm doing it for Shonda, and I'm doing it for her. And that is the story of Shonda Cher and the four girls that terrorized her. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but it's just so sad that these girls were so young and their lives were literally ruined from the very beginning. You know, but I guess it is somewhat of a nice ending if anything could, 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 could come out of it. I guess it did. And Melinda apparently is, is a different person now. Um, so at least there's something somewhat positive to come out in the end. But anyway, so thank you again to Emma for requesting this case. Um, I always see your requests, guys, so if you have any other cases you want me to cover, just leave them down below. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video.